So uh, thank you everybody for coming to the London Free Market Roadshow. I, I was very excited about the Roadshow. So uh, first I will introduce uh, Dr. Richard Zandrich, who is a member of the board of uh, the Hayek Society, uh, the Hayek Institute and the Austrian Economic Center. Uh, he will say a few words about the Free Market Roadshow and then uh, we will uh, move on to our first panel. Thank you very much, and I'm also very excited after a difficult uh, one and a half, almost two years, to be in front of a live audience. I spoke uh, two weeks ago in Zurich, uh, but that was the first live event uh, we've done in a, in a long time. Uh, I'm here today representing Dr. Barbara Colm, who unfortunately had uh, a death in the family and uh, could not attend. My name is Richard Sondrich. I'm a member of the board, as said, of the Austrian Economic Center and one of, one of the first uh, in the Free Market Roadshow. Now, we started the Free Market Roadshow, or its precursors, just after the Iron Curtain came down from Vienna, the idea being that uh, we would give a little aid in free markets to uh, the ex-communist countries. Now, it turns out they learned very quickly. We started out in uh, Budapest and Prague and uh, uh, Ljubljana. And now they're uh, more free market than Austria is. Uh, but then, unfortunately, we had an economic crisis uh, you know, after the, after the wall came down, we thought we had won, and we had an economic crisis. And then, you know, uh, local speakers and international speakers on the, on the various topics. Uh, and then someone from the Institute, I mean, you can't, you can't do six weeks in person. So, very glad we're here and doing it again live. And... Uh, Let's start over for free markets. Thank you very much. Razi, you're going to introduce the panel. Right, so uh, our first panel, by the way, George Grigoropoulos will be moderating both panels. We had um, issues with getting a moderator and George stepped in very last minute, so uh, thank you, George. And um, yeah, so as, as, uh, as I mentioned, the first panel is on tribalism versus trade. And by the way, we have uh, plenty of time for this panel. It's gonna be uh, over an hour and a half, so uh, each speaker uh, will speak, and then we will have time for a very long <coughs> Q&A, so uh, prepare your questions uh, uh, as the panel goes along. And uh, Join me in welcoming George. Yeah, so in your invites, you would have seen that uh, the moderator was supposed to be uh, Sophie, which has clearly uh, not happened. And if you are familiar with the Einrand Center UK's events, our resident moderator is usually Nikos Sotirakopoulos. Um, but he's not here, unfortunately, he's in uh, Greece. So you still get a Greek accent, uh, but a slightly shorter, less luxurious beard, uh, but, uh, and not as loud as him, but hopefully as good. So the topic of the first panel is trade and tribalism, or tribalism and trade. And uh, when I was asked to moderate this talk, I tried to think, okay, how do I introduce it? What do these two things have in common, apart from the first two letters of its word? So I thought, um, well, trade is usually a term um, we, uh, we use to mean voluntary, mutually voluntary transactions. Um, and there are many words that can say the same thing, that can convey the same message, but typically when we use the word trade, we mean international trade, so trade between um, individuals or businesses that are in various jurisdictions, uh, various nations, different, different nations, different continents. 
and then with tribalism. Well, tribalism is a strange um, kind of concept because it does, uh, it is one of collectivism's manifestations. Um, it's how uh, collectivism manifests itself in the way people um, understand the world, in the way they perceive uh, the path to getting knowledge and how they should act. So, for example, uh, a tribalist uh, would um, not uh, think as an individual and judge in order to determine what is true and what isn't. They would look into the leader of the tribe or into what the common belief is among the tribe that they choose to, be, to, to belong to, the group, whatever it is, and then they will adopt that position about the truth. And I find that tribalism has been very poisonous in politics lately, not only because people have been defaulting to group positions in order to define how they think and how they act, but also it's being projected on everyone else. So in a disagreement, you will be called, um, you, will, you will be told that, oh, you believe this because you are a woman. You have this view of reality because you're a straight white man or because you are um, sort of, you belong in some sort of tribe. And it's almost not just the way people think, but the way people think everyone else around them thinks as well. Um, what do these two things, the, the trade and tribalism, have to do with each other? Well, on one hand, you could say that tribalism could be um, uh, an obstacle to trade because people may choose to trade just amongst uh, people of their tribe. So you could have someone who says, okay, I am a feminist and therefore I'm only going to shop from, um, from uh, shops that are owned by women or I'm, I'm a black uh, people's rights activist so I will only shop uh, from shops that are owned by black people or a, a white supremacist so I will only shop from uh, white people. So you could have that but via super chat Super chat questions will be prioritized uh, to in-person questions. Um, and then after the, the super chat questions, we will go to questions from the audience. Um, so to introduce uh, the, my fellow panelists, to my left I have Eamon Butler. Eamon is the co-founder and director of the Ayn Rand Institute. And uh, he is a prolific. Hey, no. Sorry. <laughs> you see. I'm, I'm such an objectivist, I always think about Ayn Rand. No, uh, Adam Smith Institute. So, yes, co-founder of the Adam Smith Institute, a prolific author. Um, and to my right, I have Daniel Hannan, who is... Um, <laughs> he serves in the UK Board of Trade, so clearly he knows about how uh, to plan trade. Uh, and he's a vice... Vice Chairman of the Conservative uh, Party, and he's responsible for international relations. So again, this is a topic that I guess, um, you know, this is a, a, a subject matter that tribalism impacts heavily on. And he teaches at the University of Buckingham and at the University of Francisco Marroquin. Um, and to my far right, I have Jaron Brook, the actual, <laughs> actual director of the Ayn Rand uh, Institute. Uh, he is also a prolific author. Among other books, he's written uh, Equal is Unfair, In Pursuit of Wealth, and uh, Free Market Revolution. So please uh, welcome our speakers, and uh, we'll go to their uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Um Yeah, that's it. I got it. Um, thank you very much for that. I thought I was being promoted for a moment there. Um, but uh, there we are. Um, uh, it's very good to, to be speaking to a live audience uh, once again. I think this is actually the first um, live group that I've uh, spoken to in quite a long time. Um, and I think, as far as I remember, the only uh, one before that 
that I had to speak to a live audience, um, all I had to say was not guilty. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, today I've got a few minutes at least, and it's one of the great lies, along with I'm from the government, I'm here to help you, um, when a speaker says I'll just be brief. Um, but I'll try to be brief, and I've got my uh, little stopwatch here, so that should help me. Uh, uh, when we're talking about tribalism, uh, what does it mean? Well, if you look at a dictionary definition, it means uh, behavior that stems from a long, uh, strong loyalty to a particular group. And generally speaking, those groups are uh, united somehow by ethnicity, um, culture, and indeed proximity, nearness. Uh, Proximity, of course, matters rather less today because uh, it's a small world. Um, Boris Johnson said the other day uh, that um, Britain and New Zealand are as closely aligned as two, any two countries on the planet, and yet they're at the other ends of the, different ends of the world. Um, so uh, proximity matters less, and it matters less in trade as well. Um, with mass transportation, huge bulk uh, cargo ships and so on. Um, one can trade cheaply, again, with the Far East or South America or anywhere else from here in Europe. Um, ethnicity, though, and, and culture and values are still quite strong in people. And, you know, we may wish that that was not the case, but it is the case, and it's probably the case for very good biological reasons. Um, that is still strong. And, of course, when it comes to dealing with other groups, um, we do uh, resort to uh, thinking about our ethnicity and our culture and our values. Well, uh, an anthropologist will tell you that a, a tribe is technically, and this is how it arose originally, um, a group of families, basically. It's, it's, they're groups of, of a few families. But now there's a much larger um, concept of tribe. Uh, I mean, to some extent, Europeans regard themselves as a tribe, or uh, Americans, uh, North Americans, South Americans, different tribe, uh, Middle East, uh, um, possibly with North Africa, um, regard themselves as a, a sort of separate tribe, or they're seen as being separate tribe by others. Uh, and Far East, people who live in the Far East, again, they're somehow different. Um, but, of course, with any of those big groupings, there are uh, other tribal subsets. Um, for example, uh, the European Union, um, the countries there are all different, but there's a sort of you know, tribal unity between them. Um, it doesn't necessarily uh, stretch to the United Kingdom. It depends which side you're on in a certain debate. Uh, but, uh, you know, to the French, for example, we're all Anglo-Saxons. Well, uh, that's not really true uh, because uh, the UK itself is divided into different uh, tribes. You know, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. Um, and uh, some of those have uh, roots in, in, in language. The, the Gaelic, uh, well, Scots Gaelic, uh, Irish Gaelic, uh, and uh, Cornish, uh, as well as Welsh, um, are all Gaelic languages which... Uh, uh, somehow unite people in ways which aren't very visible, but they still feel quite strongly about it. And even England is divided. I mean, uh, Yorkshire is a place unto itself. It's full of Vikings, you know. Uh, whereas uh, down in the south, um, uh, we're more Anglo-Saxon uh, stock. It's just the way the, the country was settled. So, uh, so there's some major tribal divisions, and then within those, there's lots of little ones. Um, when I'm looking at uh, tribalism and trade, I think there's a sort of harmful tribalism and possibly a fairly good tribalism. Harmful tribalism is when people band together basically to keep others out. Uh, and this is very strong in, in trade. Uh, again, um, depends which side of the debate you're on, but uh, I, I think the, the EU, for example, has taken quite a hostile 
um, attitude to the United Kingdom. There may be good reasons for that, but it has done nevertheless. And you feel it's a sort of tribal dispute, that we're somehow different, which indeed we are. But uh, that, that is the reason, that is what is motivating it. So there's a certain sort of tribalism at work there. But that, that is a negative tribalism which kills trade um, because you're trying to exclude other people. You're, you don't want to deal with them. It, it, it produces a, a mercantilist point of view. Read Adam Smith if you want to know about mercantilism. Um, Compare that with movements like Kanzuk, the idea that Canada, and New Zealand, Australia, and the United Kingdom should all get together, and we should have free movement, and we should have free uh, exchange of goods, and, uh, and anything else. Yes, it's tribal, and it's tribal, one has to say. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's part, partly because they're all white, they're all rich, uh, they all have a common history, Oh, they're large, largely white, I should say. Um, uh, but they are also all liberal. They, they have a, 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 a liberal history to them, and they have liberal institutions, and they are democratic. So all of these things are very positive. It makes them open to others. Um, they're open to others precisely because they are liberal, because they believe in freedom, because they believe in trade. And the idea of something like Kanzuk is that you can create free trade within this sort of tribal group, if you like it. Um, and then, once you've got it there, then you can spread it out. You can show people, hey, this is great. Yeah, this really works. This, this enriches us. It makes us better off. We're all happier because we can travel uh, to various corners of the globe without let or hindrance. And... Uh, uh, and then, hopefully, other people will come in and say, well, um, yeah, yeah I, you know, we can see the benefits now of uh, having more free trade and, and more free movement. So I think there's sort of good and bad tribalism. <laughs> it's difficult, however, to decry one sort of tribalism while you're actually doing another. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've seen... Uh, the sort of visceral annoyance uh, in France, for example, of uh, the British, American, uh, and Australian deal on nuclear submarines, for example, and, and defense, the defense pact. Um, it's visceral. It's really quite visceral. This is tribalism at its worst. But trade, in general, reduces tribalism because it spreads the different products of different countries different peoples around the world. It spreads their culture, their understanding. You know, look at all the, all the ethnic restaurants you can find within 100, do I say yards or meters these days? I don't know. We're going back to imperial uh, uh, of, this, of this very spot. Um, so the idea of that is that it, it, it should uh, reduce the prospects for actual physical conflict. So it's extremely important. So I don't think we should deny the existence of tribalism. <laughs> the question is, how can we actually get it to work positively uh, to promote world trade and understanding and prosperity? Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see all of you rugged individualists gathered here collectively. Like Eamon, it's the first time uh, I've been at a live event, and it's a reminder that you can believe very strongly in personal autonomy without believing in some kind of atomized society, some kind of anime where nobody talks to anyone else, a point that I keep patiently explaining to my lefty friends, that no one uh, outside their fevered imagination wants a world without social bonds. A world without compulsion is a world uh, where we're encouraged more uh, genuinely, more freely to come together in such configurations as we're doing now. So welcome uh, to you all here. I, I was born uh, not in a Kansas country, but in, in Lima, Peru. And when I was growing up in the 70s, uh, Lima was a uh, 
develop a classic developing city ringed by shanty towns, by slums. You see them stretching up on the slopes of every surrounding hill. Barriadas, they were called, Las Barriadas de Lima. And we would have friends to come and stay with us from the UK, from Europe, from the US. And they would do the usual tourist thing that people do when they come to Peru. They'd, uh, they'd, they'd spend a couple of days in Lima, and then they'd go to Cusco, Machu Picchu, do the Inca Trail. They'd come back, and almost always, almost always, you'd get the same question. Why? Why are people leaving these scenic, pristine Andean villages and coming to settle among the traffic fumes and the open sewers of the Barriadas? My friends, that's a very first world question. No Peruvian ever needed to ask why somebody would leave a village where there's no drinking water, no electricity supply, no school, no clinic, no job. What was obvious to the people on the spot, if not to their first world observers, is that the lifestyle that they were swapping was not just an improvement in itself, uh, better to live with some work selling cigarettes or traffic lights or whatever than, than backbreaking uh, seven days a week in the fields, but also that it was transitional. Transitional for the individual, transitional for the place. Every industrializing country has gone through this process. It's not an aesthetically pleasing process. But it gets you from a, a world of long hours, backbreaking labor, uh, and constant want to a world of superabundance. Britain or England went through it first, and a couple of countries uh, in Northwestern Europe. I think we were scarred, particularly in this country, by going through it first. Right? When Peru goes through industrialization, they've got a roadmap. They know that other people have done it, and that you come out of the tunnel on the other side. We didn't know that, which is why I think it's left ever since this extraordinary oppressive uh, folk memory, largely written by Engels and a little bit by Charles Dickens, this idea of a bucolic sort of hobbit-like population uh, turned into factory slaves uh, in the, the fumes of Manchester or wherever it was. And yet, without that, we wouldn't have the central fact of your life and mine, which is uh, the spare time that comes from abundance. It's the most uh, extraordinary leap forward we've ever taken, but people can never see it, and they certainly couldn't see it when visiting Peru. Actually, I, I had occasion much later in life to, to spend some time in one of the Barriadas. And I, I have to tell you, honestly, I have, I have been in high unemployment black spots in Europe where there is a, a more palpable sense of despair than you found in those places. There was, a, there was an industriousness and an optimism there that you don't always find in some uh, of the housing estates in rich countries. And indeed, people were right to see it as transitional. The bad others, what, what we were uh, uh, politically correctly taught to euphemize as the Pueblos Jovenes, are indeed now much more respectable places. The, 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 it's not just that the people who've moved through them into more comfortable uh, accommodation. It's that oh, over time, the corrugated iron roofs have been replaced by something more solid and that the houses end up being connected to the electricity supply officially and all the rest of it. Things get better, but it's not a pretty process. And this is the point I want to stress. The 19th century novelist Anthony Trollope once observed, poverty to be scenic should be rural. A great deal of our critique of industrialization and globalization is fundamentally aesthetic rather than economic. I, I used to see this all the time with my children's homework. You know, it was always, particularly geography, very left-wing subject geography, and it was always telling the same story. Theresa May was a geographer, wasn't she? Always telling the same story, which is evil Western corporations are exploiting these poor women in Vietnam or wherever and making them stitch sneakers together for 50 cents a day. Right? And they would never tell the story uh, fully. They'd never say, what was, the, uh, uh, what was the wage of these employees before? Where were they coming from? What was life like in the paddy fields? And do they expect to be there forever? Is this not transitional for them? Can we at least do them the courtesy of allowing them agency, of allowing them the dignity of thinking that they're capable of making rational decisions about how to optimize their situation instead of treating them as props in our solipsistic 
emotional dramas. And if we really want to help, I always used to say this to my kids when they would say, well, look, look at all this stuff that I found about Nike or whatever. If we want to help, what's the best thing we can do? Buy more of their stuff, right? And, importantly, sell them more of our stuff so that their living standards improve, so that wages rise, and so that pressure follows for increased uh, rights and improved working standards. As I say, every country has gone through this. And it's a process of steady improvement, but it doesn't look pretty, and it runs up against instincts and intuitions that we evolved in tribes. And this is why the two things are in opposition. The great poet, historian, and Whig uh, politician Lord Macaulay once said, free trade, one of the greatest benefits any government can bestow on a nation is in almost every country unpopular. Right, he said that in 1824. Think of how much truer it is today. Which is bizarre because since 1824, the world has seen an extraordinary and unprecedented improvement in living standards. Deirdre McCluskey calculated it as conservatively as a 3,000% increase in living standards for the average human being. Right? Pretty much starting when he wrote those words at the beginning of the 19th century. What drove that increase in living standards? Lots of things, but one of them was a removal of barriers so that there was more specialization and exchange. If I think of the changes just in my lifetime, right? I was born in 1971. In 1971, it took the average British worker two months' wages to afford a TV set. Now it's three days. In 1971, a stationary car emitted more pollution than a car today moving at full speed. In 1971, fewer than half of girls on the planet got more than primary education. Now it's pretty much 100% outside a handful of holdouts like Afghanistan and not for reasons of poverty. There have been extraordinary advances on any metric, longevity, literacy, calorie intake, height, whatever. And yet, well-meaning, uh, uh, altruistic, high-minded people are constantly protesting the system that has delivered it, thinking that somehow uh, when they protest against trade deals uh, and the market economy, they are standing up for the poor. Why? We evolved in kin groups, right? All of this is unnatural to us. Free trade runs up against instincts and intuitions that were honed over a million years of evolution as hunter-gatherers. We have, for example, a very deep instinct to hoard food, to see us through the winter. Now, when you translate that into policy, it comes out as protectionism. The idea of depending on strangers to produce stuff that you can't see, which is the basis of modern economy, may have delivered these miracles of living standards. It may have made possible the spaceships and the Starbucks and the, the cathedrals and all the rest of it, but it offends our inner caveman. If you say to people in this country, do you know that we, I mean, pre-coronavirus, do you know that we import 40% uh, of our food? That leaves people uneasy. It leaves their Paleolithic inner uh, self, their, their uh, hunter-gatherer brain, uneasy, right? Because it offends that basic principle of self-sufficiency. And of course, we haven't been self-sufficient in, in food in this country since the 18th century. It was the move away from self-sufficiency in food that made us rich, right? <laughs> show me a really self-sufficient food country and I'll show you Guatemala or something, right? It's not the company that you want to be in. I say this as someone, as you heard, who works occasionally in Guatemala, love Guatemala, but they would love to industrialize and move into a services economy because they know that that will deliver higher living standards. As a consequence of what we have just been through these past 18 months, all of those Paleolithic instincts and intuitions, all of those false heuristics that we uh, derived from the savannas of Pleistocene Africa have been strengthened and exaggerated. It's in the nature of a crisis that people are thrown back on their tribal core. It's a book by uh, a chap called Sebastian Junger, an American writer, who was an, uh, an analyst of uh, of the power of, uh, of tribe. And he makes the point that every natural disaster, every war, 
on the one hand, strengthens collectivism, right? It, it, it makes people see the benefits of solidarity, common purpose, and all the rest of it. And it leaves them feeling nostalgic afterwards. He interviews a number of people who survived the siege of Sarajevo. And a constant in all of the interviews is that although obviously they didn't miss the siege, right? I mean, don't, 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 don't misunderstand this. It's not that they wanted snipers back, but they missed the emotional state that had accompanied it. The sense that there were no strangers. We're all family. Everyone knows what we're doing. We're all pulling in the same direction. Why? Because that's how we live for a million years. That's what we're designed for. And the coronavirus, I'm afraid, has flicked those switches again in our brains. And it's made life for free marketeers and believers in limited government very difficult going forward. And I'm afraid that the effects will last for years or decades. The number of people who have said previously reliable free marketeers who have said to me over the last year and a half, but surely, Hannan, even you, even you must now see why we need to grow more of our own food in this country. We're so vulnerable to these global uh, disruptions. Like, Seriously? I mean, that, that's, that's what you got from the coronavirus? I mean, the one thing that worked beautifully and without a hitch were the, the global food markets. By the way, just as well, right, the, the non-Brits in this room might be, and indeed some of the Brits in this room might be interested to learn, that the, uh, the coronavirus struck at the height of the period that British farmers call the hungry gap. Right? It's the time of your so-called, because we don't produce any food at that time. There's, a, there's a, a, a slot between the end of March and the beginning of May when we've reached the end of the winter harvests, we're not producing any more turnips or cabbages or potatoes, we haven't yet reached the start of the main harvests. Had we not been able to buy what we wanted from around the world, we would have starved, or we'd have been living on rhubarb and asparagus and maybe a bit of nettle soup. <laughs> but fortunately, everything worked beautifully, which is a reminder, again, of the essentially counterintuitive nature of a lot of what we believe, and certainly of the case for free trade. It seems intuitive that growing your own food must make you more secure. You need to explain to people why that isn't true, why if you actually want food security, the way to do it is to purchase your food from a wide variety of global suppliers because they won't all simultaneously be disrupted. And we saw that stress tested beautifully last year. Having a sole supplier leaves you vulnerable to a local shock even if that supplier happens to be in your own territory, right? It's, but, but that is a point that doesn't come naturally. It's a point that needs to be explained, or at least illustrated with examples. My favorite example on food being the two countries at the most extreme ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, the country that has elevated self-sufficiency to its supreme governing principle, North Korea, Juche, they call it. Everything that can be imported should be substituted if possible, whereas at the other end of the scale, I give you the country that imports every uh, edible ounce, doesn't grow any food, doesn't produce any water, depends on imports, or it's electricity that works, Singapore. Where would you rather live? <laughs> North Korea is the last place in the world to have man-induced famines. Singapore has the cheapest and most secure food supplies on the planet. All of these arguments were hard enough to win two years ago. Now they are going to be much harder. The elevation of the individual, on which all of the doctrines of free trade and free commerce, and indeed free enterprise, ultimately depend, do not come naturally. We existed as a species without them for a very long time, and it may well be that we look back at the last 200 years as a blip, as an interglacial, but before the restoration of the norm. I'm struck when I think not just of our, our fairy stories, our folk tales, but even of our science fiction. I mean, think of Star Wars or something. It's full of, of emperors and princesses. Right? On some deep level, we think that this is the normal way of running things. We are living in extraordinary times and in an extraordinary place. We are luckier than we know, happening to inhabit a polity where status has been displaced by contract, where the individual has been elevated above the collective. 
And this is why I, I, I want to finish with it with a point that goes beyond trade. When I look at what Eamon just touched on, the growing doctrine of collective identity as taught in our schools and universities, the idea that the only important thing about you, or at least the most important thing about you, is that you're female or white or whatever it is. I don't respond by saying, oh, harumph, harumph, political correctness gone mad. I see a threat to the entire world created by the Enlightenment. Because the elevation of the individual is counterintuitive. It has to be taught. Hannah Arendt, the Eichmann chronicler, said every generation Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children. Right? What she means by that is you and I came into the world with basically the same mental and emotional apparatus that we would have done 5,000 years ago. The reason we don't live the way we would have done 5,000 years ago is because we've benefited from a series of learned techniques, what we mean by acculturation. And we have to be taught, habituated, in ideas that do not come naturally, that are not innate. For example, the idea that someone you don't much like might still be telling the truth. The idea that someone who is not in your tribe might have useful things to tell you. The idea, indeed, that uh, the truth is something that can be approached through experimentation, through the empirical method, through scientific inquiry, rather than being something that is passed down by some sacerdotal class who have a monopoly of virtue. None of these things come naturally. All of them need to be constantly taught. There was a row last month. It was one of these delicious... I, I, I'm looking forward to the uh, Yaron versus anarcho-capitalist row coming because there's nothing, there's nothing like what, uh, what Freud called the, uh, the narcissism of small differences. But there was, a, there was a, one of these intra-right rows last month when, do you know who I mean by David French, the, uh, the, the anti-Trump? You, you know who he is, right? He wrote a piece, actually a, a thoughtful piece, with which I on balance disagreed, about whether there were collective liabilities. And he gave the example, the, 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 the peg was that a pastor had been removed by his congregation, somewhere in the US, for being too woke and too pro-BLM and so on. Uh, and this was supposedly unchristian. So, so David began by making the provocative, but it seemed to me quite true point, that saying that uh, on all the grounds on which you could have attacked this pastor, saying that what he was doing had no biblical basis was quite an odd one. And he then ran through a series of examples in both the Old and New Testaments where uh, tribe and blood guilt and vendetta and heredity are seen as uh, uh, defining. Right? There was a particularly eerie story I'd forgotten this one. From the second book of Samuel, David is the king. And there's a famine, right? It goes on and on and on. And he prays and he says, what's the problem? And God says, the problem was your predecessor. Right? Those of you who remember this, they, 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 Saul and David had, had not, hadn't been a peaceful transfer of power. But nonetheless, he had the collective guilt. Your predecessor broke a treaty to attack the Gibeonites. And you are being punished for his breaking of his word, Right? David then goes to the Gibeonites and he says, okay, what do I need to do to make this right? What restitution do you want? And this is really very uh, disturbing to modern sensibilities. The Gibeonites say, hand us over seven of Saul's grandchildren for execution. Which he does, and the famine ends. Right? Now, I'm pretty sure that, that, that uh, David French's point was not that all white people carried some kind of collective guilt like that. He was simply making the point that this is how most societies operated for most of history. Right? Read Joe Henrich's work about uh, uh, the oddness what, of, of what he calls the weird people in the West. That we, are, we are living in very peculiar places where we're not defined by ancestry where blood guilt and vendetta are not the normal form of ethics. In 8th century uh, Israel or 6th century Babylon, wherever the book of Samuel was written, it went without saying as it did in almost every society and still does in the remaining hunter-gatherer places in the world today, that of course you can uh, take your revenge on people because of who they're related to, right? The idea to us, the thing that makes that story offensive to us, the idea that, well, hang on, what had Saul's grandchildren done wrong? What, what was it to do with them? Is a very peculiar modern one, and it needs to be taught. We need 
to civilize those barbarians who invade us in every generation. And that is the job of schools and universities. They are there to be temples of the Enlightenment. Instead of which, they're doing the opposite. They're not just failing to teach the counter-cyclical idea of individual autonomy. They are teaching the pro-cyclical idea that, in fact, all that really matters is which group you are in and where you belong in this imagined pyramid of hierarchy and oppression. And my problem, I, I disagreed on balance with David uh, French. He was saying, well, you know, do, do we have a, uh, if, let's say, black people in a, in a US city are suffering from bad schools and poverty because of previous injustice, because of residential uh, segregation or redlining, is there a collective liability? And I would say, no, there is an individual uh, case to help people as individuals, right, rather than by ancestry. Because once we start going down this road of saying, what matters is from whom are you descended, where does it end? I remember as a, as a quite small uh, boy, I must have been nine or ten, my, uh, a friend of my parents uh, was incredibly rude to this young couple who he'd only just met. Unbelievably. So, so much so that my parents walked out. And my mother afterwards said, what did you have against those people? You'd, you'd never laid eyes on them before. You, you, were, you were obnoxious from the moment you went in. And he said, I, I had enough of French Canadians during the war. Right? Now, now age nine... I could spot what seemed to me a pretty big flaw in his morality, right? Which is whatever he'd had, whatever problems he'd had with French Canadians, it wasn't that couple. But that's because I had been taught in a particular way, as most of you have, to think in a way that elevates the concept of the individual. Most societies in most times would have regarded him as reasonable and me as rather freakish for having that objection. And that's why I say it is so precious. And that's why I am so alarmed when I see this doctrine of collectivism being elevated to an almost religious status, being sacralized in our places of learning. My daughter is reading French. As a condition of, of being at her college, she had to do an unconscious bias test. Now, 200 years ago, to go to Oxford, you needed another test, which was just as irrelevant to doing a language. You had to, it was called the Test Act. You had, to, you had to swear an oath denying the doctrine of transubstantiation. Right? Literally, in order to matriculate as an Oxford undergraduate, you had to say, I, Daniel Hannan, hereby swear that the blood and wine used in the Eucharist are not actually the body and blood of Christ. They are only symbolic. Right? What's that got to do with the French degree? Right? exactly as much or as little as the unconscious bias test. And if you can't see that, my friends, you're inside the matrix, right? They are both things that have been elevated randomly and sacralized because society happens to be looking through one prism. But in between those two examples of intolerance flourished this extraordinary world where we were able to relate one with another as autonomous individuals without our relations being mediated through birth or caste or tradition. There was a wonderful world where we were all valued for ourselves rather than being judged by accident of physiognomy. There was a world where personal responsibility was elevated over tribal identity. Only now do we see that world receding. The Owl of Minerva wrote Hegel spreads its wings only with the gathering of the gloom. But I'll tell you this, we're going to miss it when it's gone. Well, thank you, Eamon. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so... You just heard a, a fantastic description of the great abundance that we all live with today. And uh, I agree with every word of it. I mean, the world in which we live today, from a material perspective, is truly astounding. And those of us who have traveled a little bit in the world and have seen maybe places that don't share this abundance have an appreciation for how rich, how good our lives really are in the world in which we live. It, where even what we would call poor people uh, as comparison to the poor in Cambodia or the poor in some regions in Africa, relatively well off uh, in comparison. Where they, and and, and it's, it's truly a tragedy that we here in the West 
have almost no appreciation for the wealth and prosperity that we have. I think, though, to understand why we have this prosperity is key, key. Why it is that we have been so successful at creating this abundance. And what were the causes of it? And why is it that other places in the world do not have it? And again, I agree uh, with what's been said about the source of this is the Enlightenment ideas. The source of this is that great period in the 18th century that saw the ideas that, it, that we take for granted, and indeed now we are teaching the opposite of at our schools, at our universities, and everywhere. But what were the key concepts? What were the key ideas that generated the prosperity that we have today? What was the Enlightenment really about? And I think this relates to both the issue of tribalism and the issue of, um, of trade or free trade. Because I agree with what Daniel just said. You know, what we have today is a massive achievement. What we have today is an aberration, a historical aberration. It's a historical aberration caused by extraordinary intellectual period in the history of mankind called the Enlightenment that came out of a whole sequence of events, but ultimately uh, the, the philosophers, the economists, the social thinkers of that period are responsible for what we have today. So what, were they, what was the great achievement of the Enlightenment? I think of it as basically two fundamental ideas that were entrenched into Western civilization during the 18th century. And the first, I think, and maybe the most important, is the idea that reason is a means of knowledge. It is the idea, in that sense, that the, the, the first Enlightenment thinker you think of is Isaac Newton, right? The idea that we can explain the world through science. We can explain the world through a particular process. That the world truth is not available to us through some kind of revelation, whether religious or platonic. It doesn't come only to philosopher kings who meditate and discover the world of forms. It doesn't come from ancient books. It doesn't come from wise men in Rome or the local church or the local synagogue. But the truth comes from a particular way of looking at the world and a particular methodology, a scientific method to discover what is real and what is not, what is true and what is false, and ultimately what is good and what is evil. So the efficacy of reason is that great, I think, achievement of the Enlightenment, of the scientific revolution. And after all, what is the other name for the Enlightenment? It's the age of reason. So this is not new. This was recognized. I need an authority to tell you what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong, what is true, what is false. But you, any individual, can actually understand the rules of motion once Newton discovers them and explains them to you. That we have the capacity to know reality and to know the truth. That is massively liberating. People forget, I was talking to, talking to high school yesterday, and uh, they don't know that 250 years ago, you couldn't choose your career. You did what your father did. You belonged to a guild. I don't know how many of you know the story of Leonardo da Vinci. Why, why did Leonardo da Vinci get, was able to do whatever he wanted? He basically was an artist and an engineer, and he did all these things. Because his father was a notary. He should have become a notary. Why wasn't he a notary? Because he was his father's bastard son. He was born out of wedlock. And therefore, he's not allowed into the guild. And therefore, he was free to actually choose a career. <laughs> if he'd born from a legitimate marriage, he would have been stuck. We would have never had Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. But once you say, we are, once people recognize that they have reason, that they have this capacity to think, to understand, to guide their own life, then wait a minute. Why should I do what my father said? Why should I follow the tribe? Why should I follow the king? Why should I follow any of these authorities? I have a mind. I get to choose. 250 years ago, you didn't get to choose who you married. But again, if you have a mind, I want to be able to make those choices. I want to pursue the values that are important to me. You suddenly didn't get to choose your political leaders. Same thing. 
If I have a mind, why can't I be involved in that decision? So the second concept that comes out of this, naturally, out of this idea of reason, the efficaciousness of reason, is the idea of the sanctity of the individual. The crucial importance of individual as the moral unit and as the important unit for making decisions. Decisions are not made by an authority. Decisions are made by us as individuals. And you get a blossoming of the idea of individualism. And you indeed get the creation of the first country in history based on the principle of individualism. We have individual rights, inalienable individual rights, according to the founding fathers of America. Now, granted, not applied consistently. It took decades, some would argue, over a century to apply it consistently, certainly to apply it to women. It took about a century, over a century. But it is those ideas, those concepts, and that political structure that made it possible for those ideas to ultimately be applied more consistently throughout the Western world and in a growing and growing to more and more parts of the world uh, over time. So, the idea of individualism, the idea of the sanctity of the individual, the idea of the sanctity of individual choice and the importance of individual as a moral agent, and that the purpose of government, according to the founding of America, was to guarantee those rights, to secure those rights, to protect those rights, and otherwise leave you alone to make your own choices. That idea is a massive achievement, an achievement of thousands of years of philosophy, and it's achievement that broke, in my view, the chains of tribalism. To the extent that it is understood, then you are no longer determined by the color of your skin or the ethnic group that you were born into or the particular geography of the place you were born to. The achievement is to rise as an individual, to think for yourself, to choose for yourself. To associate with the people who you view as values, whatever color skin they have, whatever uh, you know, other characteristics that are unimportant to life they have, but who might share your values. And indeed, it is this idea of individualism and this idea of our capacity and ability to think for ourselves that opened up the world, that made it possible for us to engage with other cultures, ultimately. Not in a position of authority, not in a position of enslavement, but in a position of equality, in a position of trade. And again, it took a century to get there. But it's these ideas that made that possible. Unfortunately, really from the end of the Enlightenment, and we can debate when that exactly happens, these ideas have been under attack, primarily from the Germans, surprisingly. Right? from Kant to Hegel to Schopenhauer to Marx to the postmodernists, the ideas of reason, the efficaciousness of reason, the ideas of individualism have been under constant pervasive attack. The longing for the nobility of the Middle Ages, the nobility of the little towns. You know, there's no accident in visiting Peru they see these little villages and how quaint and how nice they are. They don't, have to, they don't have to live in them. That's why they see them so noble. But this is not new. You can find writers in the 19th century longing for the wonderful days of little villages and everybody's a farmer and everybody's, you know, children not making, you know, 50% of children dying before the age of 10 and all of that fun stuff that was involved. That's expectancy at 39 and all the fun stuff that was involved in pre-industrial revolution life it happens to be. You can't think for yourself. You can't use your mind. You can't choose for yourself. Your values don't matter. Others, the leaders of the tribe, whatever tribe happens to be, will make the choices for you. Don't worry. Be happy and mindless because that's what it really is demanding of you. Mindlessness. So we are fighting a fight that's against unthinking. And unfortunately, the unthinking is promoted 
by our university professors who are supposed to be the thinkers in the culture and is couched in you know, very, very uh, articulate, um, sophisticated, often unintelligible language to explain so they look sophisticated. But this is the same battle that the Enlightenment fought against those that came before. It's the same battle that liberals fought in the 19th century against the anti-liberal forces that were arrayed against them uh, during the 19th century. It's the same battle that we need to continue to be fighting. Um, there are no shortcuts. There's nothing simple about this. It, it's not enough just to explain the economic theory because it's deeper than that. It does have roots in this idea around reason and one's capacity as an individual to actually exercise it. It is rooted in the idea of whether we have, as individuals, rights or not. I worry a little bit that we focus too much in favor of the tribes. And look, tribes don't think, because there's no such thing as collective consciousness. There's no such thing as collective thinking. So a tribe needs a leader. And the leader does the thinking for you. And you follow, and you do what they say. So, I think the battle that we all face is a battle to save the Enlightenment. Whatever good that exists in the world in which we live today is a product of that Enlightenment. And our job is to defend, to defend what they discovered, reason and individualism. Thank you. I'm less rationalist. I do think that blood is thicker than water um, and that countries with a common, or individuals with a common um, history, ethnicity, um, and proximity, uh, that those are actually important things um, in the human mind. Now, we may wish uh, dearly that that wasn't the case, um, but it is, and it may well be the case for perfectly good um, evolutionary uh, biological reasons. Uh, you know, it may be that being parts of groups um, is important to us in, in keeping us going as a species. I don't know. Uh, but all I'm saying is that it's, um, it's uh, very deep within us. And therefore, when you look at uh, trade deals, for example, uh, you know, I, I wish we didn't need trade deals at all. I wish that people just traded and that governments didn't get into the process at all to telling us what we can and can't buy uh, from other people. Um, but, you know, who are the easiest people to do trade deals with? Well, probably people who speak your language, probably people who've got a common history or common roots, uh, probably people who identify with each other, um, you know, pr probably people who um, have, if you like, the, the same ethnicity, the same worldviews, the same values. I think all of these things are actually quite important. And, uh, you know, that's why you, I mean, you do see quite a number of free trade agreements around the, the planet, and they're usually countries that speak the same language, for example, because I think language is very important in terms of how people actually think. Um, and, and, and that, again, is one of the reasons why people sort themselves into, into different groups, because they think differently, because their language conditions the way they can think. As President Bush uh, put it, there's no such word in, uh, as entrepreneurship in French. Um, and, of course, he's quite right. The word uh, entrepreneur in French means a sort of artisan. It doesn't mean entrepreneur. <laughs> um, so, you know, he wasn't actually wrong. Um, so, so that does condition how people uh, view the world. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's why um, our governments have started starting in, in, that, uh, in, in the Kansas model, because that's the easiest to do. Then we can add Singapore. I wish we could add Ho Hong Kong, but that's, you know, gone. Um, and there, there are, you know, other places which, again, uh, you know, because there's a, a shared sort of British history, a parliamentary history, uh, and all the rest of it, they're, they're just easier for us to do things with. We're, we're more homogeneous. I, I, I disagree with one reason that Eamon just gave, and he, it's something he said in his speech as well. Um, I don't think there is much ethnic homogeneity in Kanzuk, in the Anglosphere more widely. One of the oddities of this uh, debate is that everything is still conditioned by Brexit. It was our ultimate culture war. So a lot of people who were sore about Brexit have now argued themselves into this bizarre place where they don't want any trade deals with anyone because they, they want Brexit to fail and they, they would rather that the country be poor and that they be proved right. 
And so they, 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 and they, and the argument that they use against Kansas is exactly that. They say, oh, you know, this is just imperial nostalgia. It's all these white countries. Seriously? All these white countries? Who has the higher ethnic minority population, would you say? Kansas or the European Union? I'll tell you the, 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 the figures we have. Um, Australia doesn't keep figures, but in, in, the, in the UK, the non-white population is about uh, between 12 and 13 percent, slightly more in the US, above 20 percent in Canada and New Zealand. In the EU as a whole, it's about 6 percent. Right? Uh, what we have in common is a way of looking at the world shaped by shared institutions that elevate the individual over the collective and that elevate the rules over the rulers. And those institutions, common law, the uh, political heritage that goes back through the American Revolution, back through the English Civil War, back to the Great Charter, even back before that to the folk right of, uh, of, of pre-Norman common law, those things habituate people to think in a particular way. And they explain in very broad terms why Bermuda is not Haiti, why Hong Kong is not China. It wasn't till very recently. Yeah, why Singapore is not Indonesia, why Israel isn't Syria come to that. We, don't, we tend not to think of Israel as a, a former British colony, but of course it is also a, a common law state with uh, the same, if you like, interoperability of, of regulations and a, a similar attitude to property rights and so on. Uh, it, it, it's a model that works very well, and it, it, the reason that trade is a very natural uh, solvent within that uh, that grouping of, of countries, is that it's the most natural thing in the world to trade when you have a, a common understanding. Geographical proximity matters less and less. At the end of this lockdown, we're all much more accustomed to holding important, sensitive conversations over Zoom or Teams. It's much easier then to do that with a country where, uh, or with a business, where not only is it literally your language, but it's the same legal system, the same arbitration, the same accountancy model, all the rest of it. Uh, and that's why I see, if you like, this pivot by the UK back towards a more maritime and less continental uh, geo strategy, simply as a, a, a return to normal. You know, we, we, we lived through a highly unusual Cold War period when for good but, but, un, but surprising and, and peculiar reasons, we had to focus on the defense of Western Europe because there was a, you know, the Red Army was massed beyond the Elbe. That is no longer true. And I think it, it, inescapably, you know, Brexit may hasten it slightly, but it was going to happen. Britain is going to raise its eyes to more distant horizons again. Did you want to speak? I to. Yeah. Um, Thank you, and first of all, I'd like to say, despite my accent, I am actually Austrian, so uh, it may help with my questioning here. But we've, the tribalism debate is, is very interesting, and as somebody from, from continental Europe, I'd like to address, you know, where your rights come from and how it happens. You have, your rights come from your nationality uh, or the place you live. Now, in the UK, uh, first of all, you were subject to uh, European rules of things, and then you left. But just before Brexit, you had, for instance, in Scotland, a referendum where they wanted to decide whether to stay within uh, the UK or not. And just after Brexit, you had uh, a lot of people who had the right to uh, Irish nationality uh, wanting to join due to their uh, ancestry wanting to rejoin the EU just by getting a new passport. So I'd like uh, you maybe to address uh, those points in tribalism. I actually got myself an Irish passport um, because my grandfather was Irish. Uh, I didn't do it for any reasons of Brexit, I have to say. I did it because um, um, I, I, I had a feeling, a, a familial feeling. Uh, and that um, I thought it was uh, only right that my children and grandchildren should be 
able to share in, in that nationality. It really is as deep and vis uh, visceral as, as that. And, uh, you know, that's why I, I continue to say these things are very deep and important uh, to people. And so it's, it's not surprising that it really messes up trade. Yeah, I, I, let me... <laughs> well, not surprising, let me voice my disagreement. Um, I think for most people it is. It is true that blood is thicker than water, but I think that's unfortunate. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's sad that that is the case, uh, and that at the end of the day, what should be thicker is ideas. And, and uh, you know, I think that the reason why these trade agreements, if, if they're focused on institutions and ideas, uh, that is what makes sense. Now, maybe this is a consequence of the fact that my, ch my children, uh, fourth generation born on a different continent, not just a different country, um, and the fact that, yeah, when I go to Israel, I kind of feel at home culturally, but I'm so glad I left. Um, and that I lived for a long time in the United States, and today I live in Puerto Rico, and I feel at home wherever I go. So, so part of this is, uh, I think, a, 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 a personal thing, but I think it is, it is the ideas, the character, that who you are as an individual, that what matters, not, uh, I, I think, where you come from uh, and, um, and, and, and those kind of bonds. I mean, think about all the people who left Europe um, 150 years ago and went to America knowing they would never see their relatives again, knowing they would never see the land from which they came again. And they went because of ideas. They went because they wanted a different future. They went because they wanted opportunities. They went because they wanted prosperity and abundance and they were ambitious. Um, it, it, you know, I think that's the kind of attitude that the Enlightenment shaped of individuals pursuing their own self-interest and, and that's what made America special. And I do think America is special as compared to Europe. Um, you know, I might, I might take a different perspective slightly than my two friends here on Brexit, uh, and I'm generally for Brexit, primarily because it gives the UK an option value. I, I'm a finance guy, I believe in option values. Um, to be freer, <laughs> uh, you will see if they take the option, right? We'll see if they actually execute on the option if they turn out to be indeed freer than mainland Europe. Uh, but in many respects, I opposed Brexit in a sense that there was no barriers to trade, there was no barriers to capital, there was no barriers to human mobility. I think that's wonderful that all of that existed between the UK and uh, the rest of Europe. I wish it existed on a much more global scale, particularly on the issue of, of, of trade. I'd, I'd love to see uh, uh, trade and, and borders open up on a much larger scale than just the European Union. Uh, it's the governance of Europe and the movement the movement towards more statism and authoritarianism and, and, le and leftism, which I think uh, Brexit allowed the UK the option to escape. We'll see if they take it. I mean, it, it of course, there were, there were no barriers within Europe. That's, that's true, or yeah. fewer barriers within Europe. But, but the price for that was more barriers around them. And the, I mean, if, if you were Slovakia or something, that may be a trade-off that you would make, because most of your trade is, is, is or Belgium even, yeah. for the UK, which was always tied by history and geography to other continents and archipelagos, by migration, ethnicity, by language and law, it never made as much sense. I, I'm, but I'm going to try something which is difficult in front of a, a, a partly Randian audience, which is to make a defense of the nation state. Because in, in this imperfect Aristotelian sublunary world, right, the, the alternative to the nation state is not some imaginary uh, either objectivist or anarcho-capitalist rather libertarian paradise, right? Uh, do, do not, for heaven's sake, make the mistake that the socialists make of saying, we reserve the right to be judged purely by some textbook theory and never by any real-world approximation of our ideas, right? So, so in, the, in the world in which we exist, I will argue strenuously that the nation-state is a more secure vessel for liberty than the alternatives. The most illiberal, authoritarian, destructive ideologies, fascism, communism, Islamic fundamentalism, indeed religious fundamentalism of any kind, all presume to be bigger than the nation state. And they presume to knock down the evolved, organic, and natural loyalties that tend to secure personal freedom because they believe that they have a higher cause. I, I was very struck. It was a, a small detail, but it really stuck in my mind. It was one of the first things I remember. The signature act of the Iranian revolution, 
signature act of the, of the Islamic Revolution. Remember, it was, it was the siege of the US Embassy. And it was only later that I thought, what a weird thing that was. I mean, to attack a legation building, you know, if, if, if the U.S. invaded Venezuela tomorrow, we could, we could safely assume that the diplomatic personnel would be uh, safely evacuated through neutral countries, as happened during the Second World War, right? Uh, when the Falklands War was on, there was never any danger to Argentine diplomats here or to British diplomats there, right? What signal were you sending out when you decided to violate territorial sovereignty? Uh, and national jurisdiction like that. What you were saying is, we don't recognize your rules. We don't recognize your world order. We answer to a higher cause. We get to decide what, what the law is. And they, they carried on as they'd begun, you know, uh, uh, attacking national sovereignty everywhere, uh, you know, sponsoring militias in the, in the Balkans, in, the, in Central Asia, even attacking a, a community center in Buenos Aires. Why Buenos Aires? What, what possible strategic value but to show that they could? Because they don't recognize the nation state. And I, I think it is just worth making a, uh, a practical case. When, during the Second World War, if you listen to the constant refrain in Allied propaganda, we are fighting for the cause of all nations, they understood that to be a bullock against tyranny. I'm really interested in something else. Do you mind if I ask a question? I, I, know, I know time is short. But I, and I, I'll, put this, I'll put this to our question, but also to everyone else, because it's always really astounded me. Why isn't Austria, given the policies of successive Austrian governments on tax, on trade union rights, on employment, why isn't Austria in a worse mess? I always think it's quite, quite useful to challenge your prejudice, right? If you come, as I do, from a basically free market point of view, Austria has pretty much gone down the checklist doing everything, not, not terribly, but doing a lot of things quite badly. And yet, low inflation, low unemployment, high growth, high standard of living. What are, what are we missing? We're going to get an answer. Well, first of all, um, people get to choose which nation states they reside in, and usually your subject uh, to the laws of the state where you reside. You know, there are exceptions, like some countries tax their citizens worldwide, like uh, the US, uh, Libya, North Korea. Um, but the rest of us <laughs> uh, actually apply their laws where you reside. And I, 10 years ago, moved to Switzerland because I kind of liked what was going on there rather than uh, you're right, a state such as Austria where you have the statists in control of 50% of the economy and you have a top marginal uh, tax rate of way over 55% uh, and all of those things that you're probably referring to. Uh, on the other hand, it is still a free market economy to a certain stand, uh, sense and it succeeds because of a lot of small individual uh, companies that manage to work within. And for the size of the Austrian economy, a country with 8 million people, you all probably have heard of uh, Swarovski or Red Bull or Glock or any number of other countries. And then when I was bicycling down the Danube, uh, I stopped in a town that nobody had ever heard of, and the local firm, which employed practically everybody there, had 99% of world market share in the production of synthetic cobalt blue. You know, when the snails gave it up, they, they made it out of petroleum, but these hidden champions are, are what make uh, the country great. So unfortunately, more and more of these countries, because of uh, what you said, more and more are leaving. I remember, right, that's the theme of Atlas Shrugged, just to give a, a plug there, right? It's the atlases that hold up these countries. California is the same way, right? Why does California survive and thrive, you could even argue? It's because certain individuals who, companies who uh, keep it all going. Um, I'll just say, I, I'm not opposed to nation state. 
uh, it's a question of what kind of nation state you want and, and, uh, and whether the nation state respects the individual rights of its citizens and of, indeed, you asked where rights come from. They don't come from the state. They don't come from, uh, from uh, your ethnicity. They are part of you as being human. You have rights now. Uh, it, it, so do states respect rights is, the, is, I think, the key question. And the key question that actually ultimately drives all the other decisions, whether they do or they don't, and what spheres they do and they don't. So I'm all for nation states, free nation states, that respect the individual rights of their citizens. Okay, my next question is um, around tribalism and trade. It doesn't just manifest itself through uh, tariffs and quotas and subsidies. It could also be uh, something like uh, a campaign that says, okay, you, I w we would like you to buy American. If you're going to buy a car, buy an American car. We're not going to penalize you if you don't, but uh, we encourage you to do so. And this has happened in history in many countries. I remember there was one for uh, Greeks. They really had to push us to buy Greek products because they weren't very good. Um, but I think it happens also in Britain, like you have British meat and all that. So do you think that uh, tribalism manifested in this way is as destructive um, if it has a similar effect in terms of people still make the same choices that they would have made if there were tariffs? It's plainly not as destructive because the, there isn't the same, you know, how, how do you judge the utility? If, if you want to, to, to buy a, an inferior product, but it makes you feel patriotic, who am I to, to monetize the value of that? You know, but, but, but the, the thinking behind it is crazy. And it's worth just dwelling for a moment. Uh, when Yaron said, you know, everyone turned on a dime and bought this idea that America was getting poorer because it had a trade deficit. Again, that is an intuitive, plausible, and utterly wrong idea. Almost any non-economist, if, if told that, that, a country has a, that their country has a, a persistent structural trade deficit, is very alarmed by that idea. Uh, and, and yet you can't really find any correlation between trade deficits and growth. It, it, it just, it, 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 no one, I mean, I have a really serious trade deficit with a number of the village pubs around where I live. Um, you know, the, the, the Bell and Dragon in Kingsclear, the White Hart in Overton, the Watership Down, I buy from them way, way more than I sell for them. And do you know what? Sometimes they engage in predatory pricing. Sometimes they engage in what is plainly uh, defined as dumping. They, they give me stuff at below production price, like when they say have a free glass of wine with your meal on a Monday or whatever. Who gets the better end of that deal, right? How on earth have we maneuvered ourselves into a place where we think that cheap is a bad thing, where we think that buying goods at the most competitive price is somehow a swindle and is a, is a cost to us. And I, I, I see this in Parliament all the time, almost always actually, again, because of this, this old culture war of, of Brexit and people now wanting all of the, uh, the, the trade deals to fail. And there was an absolutely brilliant example uh, a few weeks ago where we were debating food poverty and all these Labour and Lib Dem uh, spokesmen were, were standing up saying, this is terrible, you know, the, 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 the richest 10% spend only 16% of their post-housing income on, on food, and the, for the poorest 10% it's 76%, and what can we do? And then the next debate happened to be on the Australia trade deal, and exactly the same people, without being aware of the contradiction, said, oh, we've got to protect our country from being flooded by cheap food, right? And it, it, it's the, it, ultimately... It's, it's two things coming together in their case. It's, it's hostility to, 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 to global Britain and, and, and alternatives to the EU, but it's also something that they know has much wider purchase, which is this intuitive hankering for autarky. Uh, the, the assertions on which mercantilism stands all sound perfectly reasonable. We have to protect our strategic industries, we can't compete with slave wage economies. We can't carry on with a permanent trade deficit. We should grow more of our own food. All of them, all of them, when translated into policy, serve to make a country needlessly poor. How about retaliatory uh, measures such as... Again, it's crazy. I mean, there, there, there was an economist, uh, I forget her name, but there was an economist in the 30s who said, if the other guy wants to put rocks in his harbour you don't respond by putting rocks in your harbour. Yep. 
And one, land, one last question for uh, Jaron. So, do you think it's becoming harder to get rid of um, tribalism in epistemology because people uh, are uh, faced with more complicated questions and the, um, the expertise that is required to get to, um, to the truth is not widely available. So then people would say, okay, I cannot do all that research by myself. It will take me too much time. It will be too hard. I don't have, uh, I don't have the energy or you know, will to, to take all the time to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose which authority I'm going to trust. Um, and then they choose that maybe making an assessment of the author on the authority's abilities, maybe making an assessment of the authority's um, intentions. So no, I, I don't think it's because the world is getting more complicated and it's harder to, to make decisions for yourself. We, we're very good at making those kind of decisions when we buy a computer, when we, uh, when we do day-to-day -day, uh, activities, even when we go to the doctor, though maybe in the, in the UK it's a little different, but you know we, we get second opinions. We uh, we do some research online. It's easier today to do research online, much easier than it ever has been uh, in human history. I think it's in those areas where politics intervenes, is where we tend to then say, okay, but who has this opinion? I mean, th there's a there's a there's a trend in the U.S. right now where patients will not go see, if they're a Democrat, they won't go see a Republican doctor. And Republicans won't go see a doctor who's a Democrat. They literally ask their doctor who they voted for and decide whether to go to the doctor or not based on that. Now that is sick. There's something really, really sick about that. Um, and of course, there's a whole now, I was just reading, uh, just last night I was reading this thing about uh, the James Beard Award. I don't know if you're familiar with James Beard Awards. They, they give awards for, for, for excellent chefs, you know, the best chefs. So, and now the James Beard Awards are going to have a component of not just the quality of your food, but how socially conscious you are. That is, uh, how socially just are you? Uh, you? Are you privileged? And to what extent does that privilege manifest itself, I guess, in your food? I don't know. Uh, so the award is now going to be, it's not that there's going to be a separate award for social justice. I mean, you can imagine that, okay. No, it's going to be interwound with the quality of your food. So uh, imagine now that that gets into one with the quality of the surgery, right? Uh, you know, I'll recommend a surgeon to you, not because he's good, but because he happens to have the right intersectionality score, right, uh, in, in terms of social justice. And uh, so it, it's gotten to the point where everything now is politicized. And this is a consequence of big government. This is a consequence of the fact that government is in all of our lives. Why does government have a position on COVID? I mean, government shouldn't have a position on COVID. Government should do what government does, protect us. So it should be isolating people who test positive. It should be making sure that if you test positive, you don't infect other people. And other than that, leave us alone. You know, insurance companies and drug companies and doctors and hospitals and the private sector can handle distribution of vaccines far better than the government has. Just look at what Walmart does, or sorry, Amazon does every single day. And look at how the U.S. government distributed vaccines for COVID, where they trashed tens of thousands of doses because the wrong people were getting them based on some rigorous bureaucratic methodology on who should get them and who shouldn't. Imagine using the price mechanism to distribute vaccines. I know even among free marketers, that is a bit of a, that is a, bit of a difficulty. But, but it's not like only rich people would buy it. It's like companies would buy it. And insurance companies would want you to be vaccinated because they're insuring you. And it's, it's your employer would want to buy them because they would want you to come back to work. And there's a lot of people that would buy these vaccines and pay a lot of money for them. And all of us would get vaccinated probably much faster. So why is everything today politicized? Because the government is in everything. Why is social media politicized? Because the government is is involved in social media. It's putting pressure on social media companies. In every respect, things get politicized when politics intervenes in them. And because we live in a world with unlimited government, it might be limited in, scope, in, in size, maybe, but it's not limited in scope. They'll do anything. Everything becomes politicized and everything becomes tribal. And I don't trust your information because I don't trust your science because you're a lefty. 
So I don't, you know, people don't trust scientists because of their political, <coughs> political standing. Um, that's the, that's why I see the tribalism. I don't see tribalism when people decide between a Apple and a Dell computer. I mean, other than that, people like me who buy Apple, clearly we're tribal, we'll buy anything Apple makes. But that is a choice, it's a complicated choice, it's computers, I don't know how computers work. And yet somehow I managed to choose a computer and to choose a phone. So it's not complexity, it's politics. Thank you. Okay, now we have a bit of, a uh, very little bit of time, so we'll go straight to the super chat. So we had one super chat from Hugh James, thank you, Hugh. It doesn't say who the question is for, so I'll put it there and you can choose if you would like to answer it. Do you think Trump has set a status quo for American trade policy? Seems like Biden is America first in all but name, apart from immigration and climate. I'll, I'll take this one. Yes, I mean, there's no question today in American politics, the people who believe in free trade, the believe in, people who believe in trade are silent. So there's still some in Congress, in the Senate, in the House, but they won't speak because they're, they're Republican. they tend to be Republicans who are afraid or centrist Democrats and, and their numbers are shrinking, but both, Democrat, both the left and the right today in the United States are anti-trade. And this notion that Trump was just about trade with China and there's some justification and all of that is, is, is nonsense. I mean, uh, we've got tariffs in Canada, we've got tariffs in Brazil, we've got tariffs and certainly threats of tariffs on the European Union, we've got threats of tariffs on our allies, not just our supposed enemies. So uh, the voices of the three traders have shrunk dramatically in American politics. I don't think you get elected today in America if you advocated for free trade or you articulated any kind of free trade position. Can, can so, I add that it is particularly, in, I'm, I'm delighted that this country is finally uh, dropping the unscientific and needless checks uh, on inward travelers. Uh, the, the United States is a long way from doing that. And, and what is even more bizarre about it is that the countries from which you are not allowed to travel to the US are those which happened to have high infection rates before the, the virus had reached the US, right? So it's, it's like those Bordeaux wine classifications that reflect the ranking as it was in 1855 and no one has bothered to change them. So the, the, the Trump administration slapped these restrictions first on China, then on Iran, then on the EU, then on Britain, then on Brazil, India, South Africa. Africa, right? Uh, you cannot go to the U.S. from those places, but you can go via Mexico, where the, 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 the infection rate is way higher, the vaccine rate is way lower. You can go from the Seychelles, that is currently the most infected place in the world, from Barbados, you know, from Peru, my native Peru, which has the highest death rate in the world, because, I'm sorry to say, there is no hurry to fix it, because Biden has clocked what Trump clocked before him, which is that there is a substantial chunk of the population that doesn't mind the borders being closed as a general principle, not as a response to the coronavirus, but as a desirable end in itself. And no one particularly wants to take that constituency on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there's a rationale. There's a rationale. You, we can disagree about it, right? We can, but, but if you do not have... Uh, the, the virus in your country, there is a rationale for, for a travel ban. The rationale for the Trump travel ban had expired by April of last year. Zero? I mean, this, this free, free New Hampshire has been going on for, I don't know, 20 years I've been hearing about it. As far as I know, they have, you know, New Hampshire has become a democratic state during that period, not even, not even moved towards more free markets. So, I mean, no, it's a fantasy. It's a fantasy that the United States would let any state secede. Um, it, 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 it's not happening. Um, if you want low taxes, the only place on planet Earth where U.S. global income is not taxed, there's only one place, and that is Puerto Rico. Um, sorry, may I make one, one more point about that? I mean, I, I think... Before, even before 20 years ago, Ron Paul was always talking about the, the northern secessionists prior to the Civil War. There was, a, an, an, it, there, was an, there was an abolitionist movement in the North, a small one, but it, I, I think it's historically interesting saying, we should secede so that we are not sullied by the abomination of slavery. So I suspect there were some secessionists uh, in New England before. But I, I agree, it's not going to happen. And, 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 and the, the US Constitution always struck me as being 
having an odd lacuna. It goes into great detail on whether you need two witnesses in a treason trial, and it doesn't mention whether you're allowed to leave. I'll just make a separate point, though. I live in Old Hampshire, which, if you count it on the full county borders, has the same population as New Hampshire. New Hampshire, unlike Hampshire, has its own legal system, its own police force, its own tax system, its own welfare system. Short of secession, it must always be a good thing to take decisions as closely as possible to the people that they affect. And one thing I would love to do is to re-import our revolution and return to the idea of the dispersal and devolution and democratization of power. I refuse to believe that people in England are uniquely incapable of local self-government. And one thing that I think would, uh, would make government smaller and more accountable is bringing it closer to the electorate. Right. Thank you all very much. I think uh, we've exceeded our time, so we're going to go to a quick uh, break of 10 minutes, and then we'll come back with the next panel. Thank you very much for this discussion.